Ah, uh, the Nintendo GameCube, a compact powerhouse that gave us some of the most unforgettable gaming experiences of the early 2000s. But what made its games look and run so beautifully as we remember? Well, today we're going to dive deep into the GameCube's GPU to find out what made it tick, how it worked. But if you're new to the channel, before we begin, make sure you subscribe for more future tech videos where I talk about and do everything tech on this channel. And if you enjoyed this video at all, make sure to smash the like button. That way YouTube will actually show this video to other people who may enjoy it as well. I greatly appreciate your support. Now let's dive in. At the core of the GameCube's visuals lies the Flipper GPU, a custom graphics processor co-developed by ATI and Nintendo. Running at 162 megahertz, Flipper wasn't about brute force, it was about efficiency and clever design. And that strategy paid off. Let's break down the Flipper GPU, starting with one of its standout features of this GPU, which was its integration of embedded memory, specifically 3 megabytes of 1T SR RAM split into two crucial sections. First, you have about 2 megabytes dedicated to the frame buffer. This is where the console stored rendered image before they were displayed on the screen. And then there's about one megabyte allocated for texture memory, handling the textures that wrapped around 3D models to give them life. This fast embedded memory helped reduce load times and allowed for quicker data access, making in-game actions feel smoother and more responsive, as well as having a lot of details on the screen. Now the frame buffer and texture memory both are backed up by 24 megabytes of additional 1T SR RAM to act as the main system RAM, which is made up of two 12 megabyte banks, and also another 16 megabytes of DRAM used as an IO buffer for the audio and the DVD drive. Overall, for the memory bandwidth, we're looking at 2.6 gigabytes per second. So in total, the Nintendo GameCube had 43 megabytes of non-unified memory, where sections of the memory was broken up into dedicated parts for specific tasks which allowed for better optimizations for the GPU even further. But the Flipper GPU didn't just have impressive memory though. It had some serious graphical muscle. Its peak texture read bandwidth hit a whopping 10.4 gigabytes per second, which at the time was quite high, especially for a console. This high bandwidth allowed for faster access to large texture files, resulting in more detailed environments and character models. Games like Metroid Prime could render vast, immersive worlds without sacrificing performance or detail. The Flipper GPU also had a suite of other advanced imaging processing functions. Fog effects, subpixel anti-aliasing for smoother edges, bump mapping for realistic textures, environment mapping to create reflective surfaces, and even hardware accelerated texture decompression using S3TC. This last feature, texture decompression, was essential. It allows the console to handle compressed texture data and decompress it in real time, saving storage space and reducing load times while still delivering high quality graphics. Take The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker for example. Its cell shaded art style wasn't just a creative choice, it was a perfect fit for the GameCube's capabilities. The Flipper's GPU's multi-texturing and anti-aliasing allowed for clean lines and smooth animation, making the game visuals pop in in a way few others could replicate. Without these features, the game's bold colors and smooth edges wouldn't have looked nearly as polished. But it didn't stop there. The Flipper GPU worked seamlessly with the GameCube's custom mini disc format. Games were designed with the Flipper's strengths in mind, leading to faster load times and optimized performance. So even though the games operated on discs and not any internal storage, this meant that there were still less loading times and less times looking at a loading screen and more time to be having fun inside of these game worlds. And while other consoles during this generation, namely the Xbox, did focus on raw power, Nintendo's approach with the GameCube and the Flipper GPU specifically was all about smart engineering. It delivered jaw-dropping visuals and with the assistance of its advanced CPU was able to do impressive things for its time. Games like Pikmin having hundreds of characters on the screen at once with detailed textures and nice models was very impressive. And then like the aforementioned Metroid Prime and The Legend of Zelda Wind Waker allowing for large environments in the case of Wind Waker open worlds and display them beautifully and really worked with the strengths of art design choices that developers at the time made. Now for specifics, the GameCube did have a pixel fill rate of 648 megapixels a second, a vertex rate of 40.5 million vertices per second, and a texture fill rate of 648 megatexels per second. And with fixed function hardware transform and lighting, otherwise known as TNL, it was capable of 20 plus million polygons in game at any given time, 8 simultaneous hardware light sources were up to 32 software light sources, and supported bilinear, trilinear, and anti-seotrophic texture filtering, bump mapping, and had a 24-bit Z buffer. 
Now these are specs that we don't really talk about as much these days, but in overall performance, a term that is familiar to a lot of folks these days, the GameCube had about eight gigaflops of GPU power. Now, per perspective, Microsoft's next generation console that come out after this generation, the Xbox 360, had 240 gigaflops of GPU power. And modern consoles that we talk about and people use the word teraflop with and associate with the most in modern day, the Xbox Series X has 12 teraflops. That's teraflops, not gigaflops, teraflops. And the PS5 with 10.3 and the PS5 Pro with 16.7 teraflops. So these are trillion floating point operations per second, not billions of floating point operations per second versus the Nintendo GameCube. But this is in comparison to the PlayStation's 2 6.2 gigaflop. So at a raw floating point operation calculation, the GameCube was the second most powerful GPU of the generation that it was in. And is why we remember so many games in our minds as looking spectacular on the console. There was a misconception that it was not powerful because graphics wasn't the primary focus like the Xbox and maybe even PlayStation had developers developing their games to prioritize. The GameCube prioritized art direction, gameplay and fun with most of their titles but was also still strong enough in its own right to port other games from these more powerful systems over with its major limitation being with the ggd or the gamecube game disc that limited how much of a capacity it could have relative to the playstation 2 and the xbox and the gamecube was certainly a fan favorite man i can't tell you how many times I would get home from school and turn on that GameCube when I was a kid and play it all afternoon. I was so desperate back in the day that I got the GameCube specifically for Pikmin. But when I got it, I was able to get Pikmin and Sonic Adventure 2 Battle. And those two games I played over and over again. And I didn't even have a memory card. I remember for like the first month I had the GameCube, my family couldn't get me the memory card because the console in those two games took everything out of them. And I was extremely grateful for it. And I wanted to enjoy this generous gift my family gave me. And I played Pikmin and Sonic Adventure 2 Battle from start all over again, sometimes multiple times in a day, over and over and over because I could not save my game progress. <laughs> These days, consoles do not give you the struggles that we used to have when we were younger but so many fond memories of the gamecube and i'm very happy to see that nintendo seems like they're going to impress us with the switch 2 and i'm very much so looking forward to it as a matter of fact the switch 2 will be my next video most likely breaking down hardware specs of a console and continuing my gpu breakdown series i hope you guys enjoyed this video again remember if you did smash the like button that way youtube will help me out because algorithm otherwise hates me and i really appreciate if you guys watch this far into the video that's everything i have for you today and i hope you all have a great day i'll catch you in the next video peace